Oh, baby, the Cleveland Browns. The Cleveland Browns. The Cleveland Browns. Rightfully took their place in history last year. Going over. If you're going to do it, do it. Go big or go home. Well, they went big, and then once the season was over, they went home. Validating that they were truly the skid marks of the National Football League once and for all. What a glorious season 2017 was for the Cleveland Browns. Well, if you're an optimist, glass half full type of person, you could say it can't possibly get any worse. And you're probably right. Because even if this team managed to go 0 for 16 in 2018, it's only them trying to follow up on last year. They've already done it once. But this also represents the chance of the true bottoming out of an organization that's been bottomed out, frankly, for a long time. And the great thing about an 0 for season like the Browns had last year is there's truly nowhere to go but up. Now, that doesn't necessarily automatically help Browns fans a lot because since this team came back into being in 1999, You've seen your old team, the Ravens, go on and win two Super Bowls and be a competitive and contending team at different times throughout its history, and the Browns have largely sucked. One trip to the playoffs in, what, 19 seasons? We're going into the 20th season of the new Cleveland Browns existence. And you're commemorating that with an 0-16 season and the retirement of Joe Thomas. It's like, no! No! You can't have anything if you're Cleveland. You get LeBron, four straight trips to the NBA Finals, win an NBA championship in there when you've come back from a 3-1 deficit against a team that won 73 games in the regular season to only now watch LeBron go somewhere else where everybody else would probably go to L.A. Then the one nice thing you had with the Cleveland Browns was Joe Thomas. 11 seasons of stud. 11 seasons of being the very best at what he did in his position. Knowing six years from now, you're going to be seeing him as a first ballot inductee into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. You lose Joe Thomas, too. It's like even good old reliable Joe Thomas just couldn't take it anymore. That's got to sting, and that's got to suck. But it ultimately is what it is. And in six years, you can celebrate Joe Thomas' uh, first ballot induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But now, at this moment in time, represents a new path, a new vision, and a new way forward for the Cleveland Browns again. But at least you could say, even though I have my qualms about everybody being so giggly tits about John Dorsey and everybody being so overwhelmingly praiseworthy about John Dorsey and some of the things he's still done make me kind of scratch my head a little bit, you feel like, if nothing else, they actually have a somewhat decent, competent person running their football operation, somebody not in over their head, somebody that can actually get the job done, and that things are going to get better for the Cleveland Browns, and they're going to get better in a hurry. And I think they're going to. You look at what they did in the offseason, you know, trading for a guy like Demarius Randall, sending Deshaun Kaiser packing. Deshaun Kaiser needed that fresh start. Frankly, so did Demarius Randall. Well, I wasn't huge on the trade. You know, the Browns weren't going to go with Kaiser long-term anyways. Best thing for him is to keep him moving somewhere else. You bring in Carlos Hyde. You spend big money to bring in Jarvis Landry after you traded for him. Then you look at the draft, this team. You were talking about all the draft pick currency that Sashi Brown and they accumulated. Now, at some point in time, you got to actually execute on those draft picks. You know, because otherwise what happens is you end up trading a first-round pick in 2016 like Corey Coleman for a bag of dicks when you could have just sat there and kept the damn pick you had originally, number two, and drafted Carson Wentz. Or the next year, instead of trading back, you could have just taken Deshaun Watson. And not if you're Cleveland. But this time, hopefully things are different. Because I'll give them this. They took a quarterback this time, and they took one number one overall. And you want to talk about balls and nuts and guts and everything else? To take a six-foot quarterback from Oklahoma with some off-the-field concerns and questions, number one overall, if nothing else, represents balls and nuts and the willingness to take a chance and swing for the fences. Then taking a five foot ten corner from Ohio State at pick four over guys like Bradley Chubb and Quentin Nelson in Denzel Ward represents swinging big and gambling. 
and staying true to whatever board you have. Uh, bringing in guys like Austin Corbett and Nick Chubb, gambling in the fourth round, and a guy like an Antonio Callaway, incredibly talented, incredibly troubled. You look at this draft class for the Browns, it represents the potential for some huge upside. It represents the potential for a really good draft class. It also could end up just being more of the same what we've seen out of the Browns over the years in the draft class that leaves you wanting, and in a couple of years, most of these guys won't be on the roster any damn ways. So let's hope that's not the case, because when you look at this team's recent history in terms of the first round picks and who's left on the team, it's not good. Danny Shelton, Cameron Irving from 2015, gone. Corey Coleman from 2016, gone. Trent Richardson and Brandon Whedon from 2012, gone. Barcavius Mingo from 2013, gone. Yeah, it's like that. It's not been good just hasn't been good. But again, it's a new day for the Cleveland Browns. When I look at this team heading into 2018, there are reasons for optimism that things could get better. I feel like they're going to get somewhat competent quarterback play out of combination of Tyrod Taylor and Baker Mayfield. We'll see how long it is before Baker Mayfield is actually starting. But Tyrod Taylor, while he's limited and he doesn't do some things, he's also not going to turn the ball over a ton. And he will be able to make some plays with his feet. He will manage the game. And the Browns might be able to win a few games with him. Long term, I think they're stupid for starting him over Baker Mayfield. But what the hell do I know? Stick with your outdated philosophy that rookie quarterbacks need to sit. But the combination of those two guys, it feels like at some point in time during the season, the Browns are going to get a stretch of somewhat competent quarterback play. And that is a huge bonus and a huge plus for a team that has severely lacked that throughout its previous 19 seasons. I think this is a team that's going to be able to run the ball with Carlos Hyde and Nick Chubb. This is a team that should be able to run the ball with more effectiveness and efficiency than they have in previous seasons. No more Isaiah Crowell. You've got Carlos Hyde, Nick Chubb. We'll see how long it is before Nick Chubb might be the primary ball carrier there, but I like their running back duo, and I think this is a team that's going to be able to run the ball. And then I look at the defensive front seven and looking at Miles Garrett and Agba and Ogunjobi and guys like other people on that defensive line. And I look at him and I'm like, hey, you know what? This defensive line is a little bit underrated. This front seven of this defense isn't that bad. You got Jamie Collins, Kirksey, and the linebacking core. You know, this is a defense you could do well with at times. This is a defense that can play well. This is a defense that could keep you in games. This is a defense that can win you some games. And I feel like we're going to see that in 2018. A focus on being able to run the ball, manage the clock, limit uh, chances for mistakes and turnovers, and play good defense. Um, I'm still concerned about things such as Josh Gordon. What's his status going to be? Because if Josh Gordon can stay on the field, if he can stay out of trouble and be there for an entire season, you talk about an offense with him and Jarvis Landry outside, and Njoku at tight end, Duke Johnson as another pass-catching option. All of a sudden, the Cleveland Browns have a couple of weapons that you're not so embarrassed by, that you're not so ashamed of. Uh, I still look at that secondary. I wasn't a huge fan, again, of taking Denzel Ward number four. I'm sorry, I just didn't really get it. Um, and I look at them in general, and they're young, and I'm not sure how good they are, so that concerns me a little bit. But you might be able to mask some of those deficiencies and shortcomings with that front seven that they have. They're going to really need Miles Garrett to start playing like Miles Garrett was projected to play, meaning he needs to be able to play 16 games and he needs to get double digit sacks. Because if he can do that, then he's bringing in up everybody else and elevating the rest of that defense. When I look at this Brown schedule for the upcoming season, I look at week one hosting the Steelers. When you look at the Steelers, they have a bad history over the years of losing to bad teams. And with the mess of the Le'Veon Bell situation, the Browns being refilled with optimism and um, positivity, looking ahead to 2018 being a clean slate, that week one game against the Steelers is a real chance for the Browns to make a statement. It is a real chance for them to sit there and say the past is the past, we are moving forward, and we're going to be somebody to be dealt with in the future. The Browns need to win that game. They have to win that game. They must win that game. And I frankly would be surprised if they didn't. They need that one really, really, really bad. 
The best way to move on from 2017 is to immediately win in 2018, send a message to the rest of that division, take advantage of a team who historically has struggled against bad teams. So many things point to this is that opportunity. They need that win in week one. And then late in the year two, as I'm assuming maybe Baker Mayfield is starting at that point in time, your last two games of the season, you host Cincinnati, you go to Baltimore. There's a chance maybe the Browns are playing for something, but maybe they're not. But it could be Baker's show at that point in time. And how is he going to do against divisional opponents? If For me, if nothing else, the Brown season is successful if they can win three games in their division and win a few other games elsewhere. And that's pretty much exactly what I expect them to do. Like, I know the over-under for them on wins if Vegas for a while was like four and a half or five. I'm taking the over this year. This is not a great team. I don't know that they're a good team yet, but they're improved. They've got some players. They've got some personnel. Now, is it going to be enough to save Hugh Jackson's job? I don't know. But this team is going to be markedly better in 2018 than they were in 2017. They're probably at least a year away from being a year away, but things are starting to slowly look up. But This is still a key, critical year for this team, and they really need that draft class with Mayfield and Ward, Corbett, Chubb, Callaway, others. They need this draft class to produce immediately, immediately. And I think some of them will. I think the Browns are going to at least win seven games this year, and they might win eight. Hell, you never know. Get, get crazy in the NFL. They might end up contending for a wild card spot in the AFC playoffs. Laugh about it all you want. Dismiss it all you want. But they are the skin marks no longer, which is cool, but then it sucks. Because that means I've got to find somebody else to pick on.